Hello and welcome to Beauty in the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and more profits. Now, today's special guest is Dr. Harvey Chip Cole III, and there will not be a fourth, just saying. He's a board certified ocular plastic surgeon specializing in ophthalmology and cosmetic surgery of the eyes and face. Now, Dr. Cole has been in practice since 1997 in Atlanta, Georgia. Now he's co-authored a dozen plus medical books as well as his own consumer facelift book. And I just wanna show it here. I, I have it and you can see it on Saturday's video. It's absolutely adorable. It has a Sharpay on it, oh, so cute. And he has given over 100 lectures worldwide. Now, although he was on Beauty and the Biz over two years ago, talking generally about his practice and our industry, Today, we're going to focus on his unique approach to facelifting using the inside out technique that he has perfected after 3,800 facelifts in 35 years. Dr. Cole, welcome to Beauty and the Biz, and I should say welcome back. Yeah, well, I'm so glad to be back, Catherine. I, I always enjoy visiting with you, and um, you're one of the people, as you know, when I'm at meetings, I love to look up and say hello to well, th this past meeting, we didn't even get to meet. We just met on escalators and we waved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some of them are busier than others. <laughs> <laughs> so look, what's the story behind this inside out facelift technique? I pretty much want you to just run with it and um, just tell us what, what this is all about and the evolution. Yeah, I, you know, I think I do need to kind of start at the beginning because it it did have a development. Uh in the in the late 80s, you know, I was exposed to endoscopes and lasers and um, way before we started using endoscopes for all the aesthetic, I was using them for lacrimal and orbital surgery. So I had a lot of experience. Um, I was also taking uh, post auricular muscle from around the ear for reconstruction. And then I was studying in the early 90s. Um, wound necrosis and specifically brown recluse spider venom where we would go out and hunt them instead of the ghost busters you know we were the spider busters and get the venom inject in the rabbits and study the whole process of scarring and so i got very interested in wound modulation and how to prevent scars how to improve scars and and really the bottom line is the best thing to do is to never give anybody a scar. And, and I like to say the worst four letter word in plastic surgery is scar. Nobody wants a scar. You know, we go to these meetings, I'm, I'm on the up talking with experts and they say, well, my patients don't complain about scars. Well, of course they don't because number one, you don't ask them. And number two, you tell them there's gonna be a scar here and there and they and they're willing to accept that to have the surgery. But I like to say, are we doing that out of necessity? Or are we doing it because it's easy or because we never thought of, is there a better way? The consumer patient cares about scars big time. Oh, big time, big time. And um, and so I started doing things like a lot of people in the early days, endoscopic, making incisions in the hairline. And, you know, one of the best things that taught all of us surgeons is all the detailed anatomy, things that we didn't appreciate before because we're looking at it like 10X and we're looking at it live in, in a pocket, what we call an optical cavity. And so I started studying all the different things around the orbit and I called them caves. And right about that time that I was teaching it to residents and fellows, because I've been doing teaching with a fellowship at Vanderbilt and University of Tennessee for about 32 years. And I was calling it caveman surgery. And what I meant by that is there's all these spaces and caves in the face. And right about that time, right across the pond, you know, we like to say in Europe and Australia and all, Brian Mendelssohn, a plastic surgeon, was, was also describing spaces. And that's kind of been the term that has stuck. But what's so nice is you've got these specific pockets and spaces and caves in the face that if you know how to access them, 
without making an external scar, you could do a full facelift without a scar on the face. And to me, the telltale sign for everybody is a distorted ear, the tragus, you know, people pull their hair up and they have scars that they could see. And, you know, like I said, people don't complain because you tell them that. But if you give somebody the choice, do you want to have a natural looking ear with no blemishes and no scars? Or or do you, are you okay with scars? You know, a lot of them will say, well, if I have to have a scar, I'm okay with it. But that's not what they prefer. And so I took it a step further and I've done a lot of uh, training in, in cranial facial and orbit. And I used to teach cranial facial techniques for years, working with various, you know, saws and and ultrasonic devices and things like that. So I started going through the mouth and also inside the nose and behind the eyelids, all these different ways to access the face that nobody can see. And that's when I kind of started perfecting the technique. And, um, and the thing that I had the most trouble with by completing it is figuring out a way to do deep neck work without making the incisions under the chin. And what I've done and realized that with all the, you know, cadaver studies and anatomic and that kind of stuff is you can go through what I call the lower vestibule under the lip, just like you're going under the lid and you can go down and get underneath the platysma through the mouth. And you could do all the work in the neck through the lip, the lower lip going down, and also sometimes a little access right behind the earlobe, and you don't even have to take the earlobe off. I think on endoscopically? Yep, yep. Endoscopic. And I'm now at the point where I can do it without an endoscope, the whole thing. Um, but certainly that's the way I teach it to people because, you know, like everything else, there's a big learning curve and a lot, it's it's really funny when I go to these meetings, I see all these people saying uh, an endoscopic approach or a hybrid and that kind of stuff. Back in 1993, I presented, I called it endoscopoid. I use the term oid, O-I-D, to be like an endoscope, but you don't use an endoscope. And it just didn't catch on that much. And here 30, 35 years later, it's now kind of the buzzword when people go to meetings, how they're doing an endoscopic approach, but they're not using an endoscope. But it's like everything else in medicine. It, it's all been invented before. It's just It just gets recycled and redone. Um, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of anybody that's ever described doing what I'm doing, you know, for the neck access. So when you're at the meeting, have you presented this at the meetings? And if so, how does the audience react? Yeah, I have. Pe people are very intimidated by it. And, and they think, you know, maybe you can do that. I can't, you know, or or they'll say, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I like being able to see everything. And and my answer usually is, yeah, but do you have to make a scar for everybody forever when you could do the same thing without a scar? And and I think that it's a, it's kind of like, when you go through your training, you know, if you want to be a top surgeon, you have to practice, you have to do things. I mean, I remember going to the butcher and getting getting meat scraps and eyeballs and things like that, cow eyes, and practicing and doing all the stuff, you know, and I still teach the residents and fellows to brush your teeth with their non-dominant hand. And then after you do that, you shave with your non-dominant hand. You start developing your ambidexterity and there's a lot of things like that that you can do to make yourself a better surgeon. So, you know, when you're taught, if you think about it, you're the person that taught you in, say, residency or fellowship to make an incision around the ear and, and, and go, you know, subcutaneous and raise it up and then enter the deep plane. They learned that from somebody else that did that 20 years before them. And then they taught you. And now 20 years have gone by. So really 40, 50, 60 years have gone by without improvement. But it takes what I call napkin time 
where I used to sit on, on you know, Delta is the hub in, in Atlanta. And, um, you know, one of my favorite sayings is, it doesn't matter if your destiny is heaven or hell, you still have to go through Atlanta to get there, you know, because of the airport. And so I call it napkin time. So That's the when, biggest airport I think I've ever seen. I, I've done like a full workout in that it's airport. crazy, and they're, they're building new concourses, you know what I mean? But um, one of the things I like to do is, in the early days, I would, on a napkin, go over every procedure I did and try to think of steps I could either change, combine, eliminate. And that helped me develop a lot of my skills because I was trying to, you know, you don't want to just think outside the box and, and, and be a cowboy. You want to you want to think outside and operate outside the box if you're doing an advanced technique that's better than what you did before. And, and that's what this is. It's, it's a better technique. And um, so it's really interesting. I also call something the tic-tac-toe concept. And if you think about a tic-tac-toe, a little, you know, there's nine, nine blocks. They're all equal. Well, if you put a tic-tac-toe at, on a profile of somebody's neck that's a little obtuse, there's like three blocks going from corner to corner. So it takes three blocks of surface area. Well, if you tighten their neck and then it goes more vertical, you go across the top, that's three, and you go two more blocks on the side. So it takes five blocks of surface area to contour the neck with a deep neck. So people think you need to take all the skin out. It's just the opposite. You need that skin to redrape without having tension to make a person look natural. So you see these people with their necks done. Yeah, they have a good profile, but they look skeletonized and they have these little bands and things. Their neck doesn't look supple and soft and elegant because they've had so much fat removed because of the approach. So if you can leave all that tissue, I never take any fat out of the neck above the platysma because I'm working under the platysma. So the skin and the and the subdural plexus and the fat and the platysma are not delaminated it's all one unit and that's what makes a person look elegant wow um we, tell us um through your evolution i'm still not exactly sure like was your mentor doing this already or was some or were you watching endoscopic surgery saying you know what it seems like i could put times 10 that or put it on steroids was it like that that's actually a funny question because I did a lot of it. Um, I was very fortunate. I trained at Tulane and we had a big, huge hospital called Charity Hospital. And it's where they take the presidents if they get shot. And, you know, the Saturday night gun club. And we used to joke around, you could sew people up. You don't have to inject them with any local because they're so drunk, you know, but you learn a lot. And as a surgeon, I did tons of, of endoscopic work. I worked a lot with the uh, the oral surgeons were actually doing endoscopic work at that time. This is in the late 80s. So I got very comfortable with it. And then when I got to my fellowship at Vanderbilt, the first year is primarily traditional oculoplastic. And then the second year is facial plastic. And you, and you spend time with different people. And... Um, and you're also in charge of the VA. So when when I would go to the VA, I'm recommending, you know, endoscopic brow lifts and cheek lifts and all this stuff to the veterans and they're they're loving it. And and I'm doing all this stuff. Well, then my attending said, you know, everybody doesn't need a brow lift. And I said, well, you know, that's not exactly true because, you know, you have this frontalis muscle in the in the middle, but on the side in the temple. That's why everybody gets the brow going down and you get hooding. There's no muscle to support that. And so all these vets that are, you know, 50 plus, they all have heavy drooping brows. So that's kind of how a lot of that got developed. So um, in your talks, you have really funny titles for things. So in your evolution, you talked about um, like, where does Baskin Robbins fit into this? <laughs> and then Graham's pot. Pot roast recipe. Can you just go over those? 
Sure, sure. Well, one of my favorite things is kind of like I said, the napkin time and thinking about things. And and I use the the story of, you know, people are cooking their first roast and Thanksgiving or whatever, and they have everybody over and they call grandma because she made the best pot roast and they ask her you know, how do you make it? And she's like, well, you get the pot roast and you cut the ends off and you do carrots and onions and celery and this and that and the other. And they're eating it. And, and the young teenager says, this is so unbelievably good and all, you know, why, why is, why do you cut the ends off mom? And she said, well, that's what grandma does. I think it lets the juices in. And so they said, well, let's call her. And they call her and she says, well, you know, honey, it's kind of embarrassing, but during the depression, all we didn't even have a pot big enough to support the rose. So we had to cut the ends off. And so the point being that you can't assume, we've all heard that one, the assume thing with the, you know, A-S-U-M-E. And so um, I always like to think about, is there a better way to do something? And that's what I call, if you take grandma's pot roast recipe, the first initials of them all, it spells a gripper. So I say, don't be a gripper to old ways of thinking. And then as far as, you know, the big craze on fat, you know, do we put it superficial, deep, this, that, and the other. And um, the first job I ever had when I was 15, I worked at Baskin Robbins and absolutely loved it. And I learned what a two and a half ounce scoop is because you had to do that and you got timed and tested. And so in people's cheeks, they need about, you know, two ounces, you know, about a, a scoop of Baskin Robbins ice cream to have the proper volume. So as I was doing deep fat work and, and things, I would kind of joke around that I've been working with fat my entire life, you know, since I was 15 at Baskin Robbins, you know, the only difference is back then I made like a dollar 35 an hour. And now I've kind of doubled that. I, I make about $2 and 70 cents an hour. If I'm doing insurance, which is why I don't do insurance anymore. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> yeah. And then what's belts and suspenders? What does that have to do with anything? Well, you know, I'm a Southerner. I'm from, I'm from, you know, South Louisiana, New Orleans and all that. And, and so you'd always see people wearing suspenders and, you know, back in the seventies, you had the overalls and stuff. And I like to teach and explain things in concepts that people can get. You know, I could get all technical and talk about, you know, desmosomes and, and synapses and the Krebs cycle and everything, just like anyone else. But I like to give people concepts so they can grasp it. And I I like to teach the face and belts. There's four belts. So you have like the frontalis belt and you have the orbicularis muscles around the eyes and in the mid face, you know, you have the the basically the zygomatic muscles that you work with a lot and you have the platysma muscle. And then when when those muscles start to respond to time and gravity, then you have to give them support. And so I call it the three R's. You have to basically release the ligaments that are holding the belts and I call the ligaments the belt loops because it's just like a belt. You have these ligaments supporting it, but if if your belt loop, you know, breaks and your belt goes down, you have to resuspend it. You have to support it. So you release the ligaments in the face, then you recontour everything, and then you reset in a in a better position. So a lot of people will tighten but they don't like release the ligament. So if you tighten, for instance, the lower lid and you don't release the ligaments in the inferior orbit and cheek, it's just going to pull right back down. And that's why you see people a year or two after surgery that either look the same or sometimes worse. And um, about 60% of my practice is what I like to affectionately call rescue surgery. It's really bot surgery. And I get people from from all over that come in for that. And uh, I talked to three people today that have already had facelifts, cheek lifts and things, and they're not happy and they've got the pulled down eyes and things like that. And these are board certified surgeons, you know, plastic, oral maxillofacial, facial plastic, you know, 
it, it's not really, the other thing I like to say is our competition is not each other. It's like Facebook and Meta and all these other things. That's what has everybody's attention. And one of the things I love about teaching is I love to cross pollinate and teach with different specialties because people have learned that you don't have to be so territorial. You know, I've done this long enough to go through all the turf battles and, and they still exist. Every big city has turf battles, but most people realize that they need each other. And that's what I like about going to meetings where, you know, like for instance, you know, Dr. Wallman's meeting is great because he's got what I call the core four, you know, and, and so he brings together, you know, oculofacial, facial plastics, derm surgery, you know, comprehensive plastic, and everybody, you know, interacts and it, and it really makes it fun for people. For sure. Who's a good candidate for this um, inside out? And is this, is this the only facelift you do nowadays for your patients? That's a very good question. I would say, let's take those in order. So the, so the candidates primarily would be people that ideal candidates, that is like 60 or below. When you get to be 65, 70 and all, you know, sometimes you just have too much laxity with skin that you can't refurbish or recondition the skin. What When people do facelifts, a common thing that they'll say is after, especially if they're teaching somebody like a, you know, more advanced person, say, a, you know, a fellowship preceptor, and they'll, they'll pull back behind the ears and they'll say, you see, there's there's hardly any skin. So make sure, you know, you don't put any tension or they'll take in the front of the ear and they'll say, isn't it amazing how little skin is? Well, people don't take that next step and think, why take out any skin? Because everything you're really doing is deep. And so you don't need to remove that skin. You can laser it and recondition it without disrupting the blood supply. And so that is the key part. And so if I have, for instance, somebody that's had a facelift or two, which I do, you know, a lot of revision work and secondary facelifts, a lot of times they have a bad scar. And if they do have a bad scar, I tell them, you know, I can make a bad scar a good scar, but I can't completely get rid of a scar. And so on those people, if, if they have ropey scars that are, you know, hypertrophied and things like that or raised, then I'll use their old approach and, and still do a lot of the things I do. But my first choice is to do it inside out with no scars on the face or pretragal or, or chin or anything. And um, the other thing I do that I think is different that I've taught for 35 years, but it just doesn't catch on that well is I do all the laser resurfacing first and everybody else does it last. Yeah. And, and the reason I do it first is if you think about it, you're you're taking off, you know, part of the epidermis. And even when you're fractionating it, you know, you're you're doing epidermis, upper dermis. Well then when you make an incision, whether it's scalp or a laser, and you suture it together, you're really suturing together like upper dermis and the skin slides over and you have no scar. But if you do it first, you're, you're creating a scar. And then when you laser, you're not really lasering the scar because you'll open everything up. So then you're lasering around the scar, which makes the scar more noticeable. So if you do it first, you, you can't see a scar. So for instance, I do a, a kind of a subnasal lip lift and I, and I fashion it into an angel wing shape. So I call it an angel wing lip lift. And I mean, I have pictures like I put on my website, you literally cannot see the scar because I laser first and then I remove the tissue. And when I'm suturing it up, all of the epithelial cells are gonna slide right over it and, and form new skin. So there is no scar. It's the same concept of, and this is where I got the idea, of people, pediatric surgeons operating in utero. So if you do, if you, you know, take a, a intrauterine baby and do surgery, 
when they come out, you cannot tell. There's no skull. And, and that's what gave me the idea of why that is. And it's the, it's the growth factors of stem cells, the amniotic fluid, all that, that helps. Well, you can use the same concept on people by lasering first so that you don't have a scar. And, and it's worked very well for me over the years. How difficult is it to educate the patient on that? Because uh, you mean CO2 laser resurfacing, and I've had that, and you're, it's a nightmare downtime situation. You know, you you are a burn victim. Right, <laughs> and, uh, right. You really think for, to, for the first week, was I out of my mind agreeing to this? Because it's right. horrendous. And yeah. everyone sees you screams, and um, it is pretty nasty. But then it's amazing. Your skin just is... It's so worth it. Um, but is that a hard sell? Because a lot of people won't do the downtime. Right. You know, it's it's interesting. It used to be a hard sell. And the reason was, um, you know, I grew up literally in, in the first laser group, uh, Coherent and all those lasers. Yeah. And then it became luminous. And then people split off, you know, and then they did Cyton. And, you know, there's it, it becomes a small family. And, you um, and I'm actually a, a medical advisor. I'm on, on the board of a couple of laser companies. And so I'm I'm always on, pun intended, I guess, the cutting edge and studying and talking to people even before this stuff comes out. And, and the biggest improvement that has been as significant as what COT was when Coherent did it is this newer laser called Ultra Clear because... It's based on an erbium platform, but you can dial in CO2 like coagulation. And so you get the contraction and the results of CO2, but you don't get near the downtime. So, so when it used to take, say, a month for CO2 to heal, and it took three or four months for all the erythema to go away, now it takes like a week that used to be a month to heal. And then in a month, what used to take four months, that's all gone, all the erythema. So that's the biggest difference. And so people have always wanted the results. But like you said, most people don't have the luxury to have that much downtime or they're not in the business. Like you and I, we could we could have laser. When I had laser back in the early 90s, I just went to work and everybody loved it. You know, and I kind of documented my own healing. Uh, we didn't have social media and things like that. But, you know, I'll see doctors sometimes on social media, you know, showing their own results. And, and to me, it's a validator. It's kind of like, you know, I never practiced general ophthalmology, but I used to always tell patients, if you're going to get refractive surgery and your doctor's wearing glasses, walk out the office and go somewhere else. I mean, he either doesn't believe in his own technology or he's a rare candidate that can't have it. And so it's the same way with laser. If you see somebody that has never had surgery, never had laser, and they don't believe in what, what they're telling you to do, there's something wrong with that. So I'm happy to tell people I had laser and, you know, I got my neck tightened. And, you know, I tell everybody that because... It just shows I, I want my talk. I, I think that's really important, by the way. You know, yeah. you be drinking your own Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, By the way, have you trademarked that name Inside Out Facelift? You know, I have. That's an interesting question because I've always been one of these old school docs that did not believe in everybody trademarking approaches and incisions and things. But through the years... I've had a lot of situations where I taught people and they went out and did it and named it or something like that, like the vampire lift. You know, I was I was on TV and all that and doing that and got all kind of recognition. And I just called it the vampire, you know, lift and injection. And, you know, and then I, I forgot the guy's name. He's out in L.A. that right. he had. Me, yeah, but he called it the ooey gooey facelift and. And it just took off, but but then somebody patented and and now they charge and this that and the other and so you know medicine's changed. I mean, it's more of a business than it used to be. Um, you know, marketing, social media, that kind of stuff. So 
Um, you know, I went ahead and, and did trade market. I mean, I teach it to people. I, you know, I like to say, you know, and I say this a lot when I teach is that, you know, I'm going to try to make you uh, a faceless genius today. And, and I start off by saying, you know, everybody's smart when they finish their training, but they don't have wisdom because they don't have the experience. And so wisdom is what you gain with experience. But if you could be a genius, that means you're you're taking the lessons and the wisdom of other people that pay that price and you're and you're shortcutting it. You're not making all those mistakes. You're becoming a genius because you don't have to make those mistakes. So I like to teach and show people and do things because I can't do all the surgery. And, and I think it's important, especially, you know, I'm one of the more seasoned docs. And, and when you get to the point where, you know, you could see the end of the tunnel that you can't do this forever. I think it's important for people to keep growing and learning. Yeah, for sure. Um, are, when you're marketing this, how, how do you market this to a consumer? Um, the word scarless rings a bell to us cosmetic patients. So right. that's a good word to use, but how, how do you go about marketing this or advertising for it? You know, I, I think one of the challenges is there's, there's a lot of unethical marketing and there's people like, for instance, that will, they'll call a liquid facelift, which is not a liquid face. It's not a facelift, but, but people market it basically putting fillers in various points and they call it a liquid facelift. That's very misleading. But then people will also call it a scarless facelift, but it's not a facelift. And so it's education is, is essentially the answer. And um, I try to do that through teaching and I try to do that with videos and YouTube and that kind of thing. And um, I do think social media has been a good platform for that, even though I was very late getting involved. I kind of, I was one of these guys that thought, you know, I've got so much word of mouth. I don't even need to do it. And then word of mouth became likes. And if you didn't have likes, I mean, you know, nobody. And and I'm just as guilty as anybody else. If I'm going to a new restaurant or something, I, I like to see what people say and and that kind of things. But, but, you know, you can't go to Yelp for healthcare, but some people, some of the young people will still go to Yelp and they should be going to Google or something that's a little more solid. Well, somehow you've embraced social media because you're up to 60,000 followers. So how did that happen? You know, I think most of it has been organic growth. And um, I do think it helps when, you know, you teach and your name's out there because, you know, some other docs will follow you. You know, I've had a, a lot of doctors say they follow me and, and that kind of thing. Um, so... I, I really think organic's the best way to do it. And uh and it, and it takes a while. And uh and and I've been fortunate and kind of blessed. Um I have a lot of fun doing it because my marketing media person is my son. Perfect. And, um and he is also wears lots of hats like most actors do. He's a actor, he's a comedian, you know, he's twice as smart as I am. And so we we get to kick around ideas and have fun with it. And every time we do something, we either get to grab lunch or, you know, shoot some things and then watch a ball game. And so so I enjoy it. I don't see it as as laborious. Uh, what kind of hours are you spending on it? Because you either spend money and let somebody else try to figure it out for you or your your time is involved and you've got to interact with the consumers, because if you're going to put this out there, Someone's got to respond when these people are asking right. questions and making comments. How are you handling that? And because some of these surgeons who are on the podcast, um, they'll they spend one to three hours a night yeah. interacting with the yeah. patients. I think, oh dear God, not the patients, prospective patients. Right, right. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't do that at all. I I would say that um, realistically, I probably spend about two hours a week, you know, getting involved because. I look at it like if they're not watching it and, and learning and want to follow, then I've kind of picked my tribe, you know, I can't take care of everybody. And, um, and I like the self-selection part of social media. Um, I like that if people, 
you know, if they want these crazy fox eyes and things like that, or they want to do thread lifts that, you know, nobody can show you a before and after picture of a thread lift that's more than a month because they only last for three days. And so everybody shows you the before and they show you on the table as a post-op. Well, that's not a post-op. That's swelling and pulling, you know. But if those kind of people are trying to find you, that's not the kind of people I want in my practice. So, so I like that part of it. I also like the way you're doing Instagram. Um, it's very informational and educational. And you still have a little personality in there. You've got like the six grandkids and you've got your rifle and all your sports kind of guy. Like you you put it all in there. Um, I really like the educational part though. You have, um, it's very simple, close-up videos and there's a question, you know, there's a question you're answering. Um, right. I love that because you already know, like I'm interested in certain topics and not others. And I love that the topic's already up there. And I say, oh, what's that one? Um, right. That's a great way to do Instagram because those who are interested in really like thinking about going to you, they need to hear you talking about clinical, you know, and your opinion on things. But then they also want to know the fun side of you, you know, and the husband of 30 years or how long have you been married? 55 years or something? or <laughs> <laughs> Almost like 40, let's see, we're 43. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's amazing. I, it's like a corny Hallmark movie. I mean, my wife was, you know, seventh grade and I was eighth grade and and I took her to play putt putt. She beat me and I was hooked, you know. Oh my God. <laughs> That's so that is really almost world record because who yeah. would even be with the same person when you're seven? How old are you? It's twelve for yeah. 13, 15. What are you? <laughs> yeah. I was thirteen, she was twelve. Yeah. Unbelievable. Okay. I mean, you literally go through like puberty and braces together, you get to know somebody. <laughs> you should write a book on that that's pretty interesting yeah. <laughs> or do a little synopsis on your instagram you know how we started how yeah. how wow, that that's a pretty big deal um by the way everybody says to me my patients will never approve my their photos how am i supposed to do my instagram they won't let me show their faces and now somehow you've managed to like you've got before and after photos galore so yeah. is there some secret to how you're getting them when somebody else says all of their patients are private yeah. You know, I think it all starts with a trust and a relationship and comfort. You know, they need to feel safe in your office with the people that are taking care of them. And what I usually will say is that it's of educational benefit. You know, I say just like you have used some of that to help you make a decision, you can also help, you know, pass that and pay it forward. And, and that's usually all it takes. Um, I don't find there's very many people that are resistant and, you know, and I, I mean, I take care of celebrities and, and people too. And, 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 you know, I've, I've had some people say things about me and, and I put it out and they're okay with it. But um, I also will, you know, certain people I'll try to show, maybe only their eyes, you know, or only their neck, you know, and, and so if they say they prefer not to, I usually say, is it okay if I do it anonymous and show a segment? And they're usually all right with that. Um, but then when you have something big, like, you know, somebody like a Gwyneth Paltrow calls you a Robin Hood surgeon. I mean, that's a big deal if you can put that out there. And so it's nice to be able to do that. Wait, what does that mean? Gwyneth Paltrow supposedly has never had anything done, so so that's a miracle. And what's her, is that a good is that a compliment? Or what, it is. What, what, it, what it means is I have. I it's like you it's like you take care of the rich and and well to do, and you're able to share it with people that are less fortunate. So my book is called Face Change, yeah. and it's a double entendre. Your face changing is what everybody gets, but also facing change in life. And so the proceeds of the book, 10% of cosmetic procedures, I give to troubled teenagers and, and people that are a bit abused and, and I have some scholarships and things. So that's the Robin Hood part. Gotcha. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. You're very big on philanthropic efforts. Yeah. yeah. And I love, I mean, you're you're working with a tough crowd there, like troubled teens. That's you not- are. You are, they're, they're so appreciative and they're so deserving and- um, you know, it's like 
anytime somebody feels like they're having a bad day, you know, just look around and see what people are going through. It's, you know, we're all so blessed. Uh, some days, the best you can do is I've got clean drinking water. You yeah. know, I, that's yeah. how I do it. I just, you know what, Catherine, be quiet. You right. are living the dream. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so let's talk about the future. Um, I'm sure you're involved in AI. You know, everyone's involved in AI. Yeah. Now. What, what are your thoughts on that and how that's going to change our industry or change right. what we're doing? I think that like any other technology, it can certainly be abused and it will be. Um, but I think that people that really enjoy teaching and educating and sharing there's not going to ever be a better platform. And, um, you know, there, like, for instance, I've been working with a group called Proxime, and, uh, and we could put a little link, you know, I guess in the deal, but they, it's actually a physician, a surgeon that saw the need even before AI for, you know, high def streaming videos, teaching and, and being present. So like, for instance, you can go into the layers of, and spaces and caves in the face and show people and you could have somebody in S South Africa doing it and you're you're live with them and you could put a dot and say right here, right above that, that's where the facial nerve is. And so make an access right below that and they do it. Or you and you can you can almost like the yellow brick road put a little dot where they need to go. And, and it's just unbelievable the things that are being done and can be done. And uh, so I really enjoy that and I'm involved with that. And, um, and I do think that's going to be a huge impact, especially for training. Um, because, you know, a lot of people at academic centers, they get to watch a lot, but they don't get to do a lot. And, and that's why early on you saw a lot of marketing when plastic surgery got very competitive. Um, I mean, it's always been competitive, but, you know, you saw, for instance, the, uh, you know, uh, plastic society, they dropped the word reconstructive. They dropped the R because they, they weren't getting the recognition that they felt like with some of the other groups. And um, then you had the core four, you know, get developed and, and plastic surgery joined that late compared to everyone else. But what's nice is now it's more collaborative and it, it's raised the standards of surgery as well as marketing and education. You know, you used to see people where even the pictures didn't match up, you know, or you saw somebody with their chin down in their pre-op, their post-op, their chin's out. I mean, you know, that kind of stuff shouldn't even be in the medical literature. It used to be, but it's not anymore. Well, there's no reason for it to be. The technology has has been so advanced. Um, we should be we should be better than that, quite frankly. Absolutely. Yeah. So to, we're getting close to the end here. I, I've added a new question, and that is, tell us one of your craziest patient or staff stories. <laughs> I think probably one of the most fun uh, patient situations is. Uh, I have operated on about probably 12 to maybe 15 sets of twins. And, and one of them said, we've always done everything together, but, you know, I want to have my facelift and neck lift and stuff, and I don't want to do it together. You know, I want to feel like it's my decision. And, and she had it done, and literally a week later, or no, I think it was two weeks later because she didn't have pictures up till about two weeks. Her twin sister saw it and they got in a big fight. And within two days, she was sitting in my office to have the exact same procedure. I want what she had. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but they were very good natured about it. But it really, it, it, it got me to understand the dynamics so much. And um, now when I take care of people that are twins or they have twins, I usually say to them, you know, it's okay if they go to different high schools or different colleges, because eventually they're going to want to feel a little bit of independence. That was kind of the big lesson I got out of it. Um, I also had a funny story with a staff member where 
we were, she was very cute and just finished college. And, and there was this one person that I was saying, you know, kind of playing the good cop, bad cop, like, you know, her, her name was Kelly. I'm saying to this patient, you know, Kelly really, really enjoys taking care of you. And, you know, she thinks you're kind of handsome and all this kind of stuff. And, and then I would say to her that he's talking about her and, and, and I was putting it all together. None of them, they weren't saying anything about each other. And they ended up getting married. <laughs> You're a good matchmaker. That's right. So, oh my God. And then the other thing that's really funny is there were so many people in our office that got pregnant a year after they got married, and they so they blamed it on the water machine, you know. And so it's just fun. We have a close knit group, and we have a lot of fun together. We've done kickball, bowling, you know, the whole bit. And I really think that patients kind of back to are they comfortable with their pictures they pick up on that and and it's i think it's overused like we're a family or family but but people could tell if it's true or not i even say in my book you know watch don't just watch the doctor and and his results watch how he interacts with his team because you could tell body language if if they respect them they like them and they work good together that's so funny you should say that. I recently had an injectable treatment by uh, a doctor friend of mine, and he, he says thank you to his staff all the time. Like when she handed him something, he said, thank you, Karen. When she gave it back, oh, Karen, do you mind doing it? Oh, thank you so much. He, right. he had such good manners, and I thought, why don't we just think about that? Why don't we just yeah. have manners and say please and thank you and hello and goodbye? I think that'd go a long way. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell us something we don't know about you. And and while you're thinking about that, I'm going to jump in on your Instagram. It looks like you have five dogs. Is that true? That is true. You know, we just like kids will be boomerangs. Kids, dogs will be boomerangs. And so usually they start off with the kids and then, you know, school, grad school or something. And then we take them in and um we love dogs and we've always had, you know, at least three dogs. And uh, my favorite thing to do in the morning is I get up and I go down the stairs and I sit there and I can't sing worth anything, but I love to sing puppy love to my dogs. And so every morning, yeah, I but do they love it? <laughs> well, they do their tails are about to knock me out. And so I like to sing puppy love and kind of play with them and, and then feed them. And so it's a little ritual. And, you know, my favorite bumper sticker I, I love and I tell everybody is go home and try to be half the person your dog thinks you are. Isn't that the truth? Uh, the way we are with our dogs versus other people, we just right. dogs are giving us what we want. It's unconditional love. They absolutely enjoy us immensely. Oh, love it. Love. They get excited when you come back from the mailbox. Or from the restroom, for God's sake. Yeah. So, so there's one more thing that I saw on your Instagram. It looks like you're being shot out of the lake with jet boots on. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. What? Oh, you, you should. It's probably a memorable experience. What the heck is that? It is so fun. There, you you hook it up to a jet ski, and it's basically a fire hose, like fifty to seventy feet shoots up water and it propels you in these boots and then you're flying around like iron man and you can you can adjust it and uh it's it's such a exuberant feeling that you you literally are up above your house and you and can the water is keeping you up in the air uh -huh. it's propelling you up and so the water that's coming down is pushing you up oh dear god yeah so it's really, really fun. And um, and I try to get everybody that would come to the lake to do it. And um, most people said it's one of the funnest things that they've ever done. Well, no kidding. So do you turn the water off gradually and that's how you come back down? Yeah, you can you can let people down. There's a hand control that where you can do it yourself. Um, but usually like especially when I'm teaching people how to do it, I'll sit on the jet ski and I'll control, I ease them back in the water. But what's so nice is you can dive in the water and they shoot back out of the water and shoot out of the water and do a flip. You know, there's all kinds of tricks you can do. Does it and, have a name? 
Yeah, you know, there's there's different brands, you know, that have gotten involved with it, but uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's definitely a luxury and a toy. Um, but there I've never done anything more fun. So you have to buy a jet ski and then you have to buy options. Well, you already you already have the jet ski. And but you have you to buy get, something else to make the jet yeah, ski. Yeah, then you get these aqua boots oh, and yeah. these thrusters and you know you you get all the little attachments. For right, it. these are for the people who have all the time and money in the world. So <laughs> not for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I love I love the outdoors. If I'm not in the OR, I'm outside. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Doctor Chip Cole, for being with us. If anybody wanted to get a hold of you, um, I know your website is Oculus Plastics. Right com and your Instagram is Dr. Chip Cole. Right. Everything's at Dr. Chip Cole. And I have kind of a Dr. Batman phone, I call it, because it's, if you just remember 404, which is Atlanta, it's 404 for the number four, Dr. Cole. And so it spells 437 2653. So 404, number four, Dr. Cole. Nice. That's so really good. I give that to my patients and doctors and I'll get calls. So it's it's kind of fun. I also have for my nurse, 404 for Oculus. Huh? <laughs> and so it's the same thing. It just spells it out. You have an interesting marketing mind, you know, you're, you're very yeah, analytical. I like to have yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're always thinking is the difference. Yeah, you're always thinking. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Everybody, that's going to wrap it up for us today at Beauty and the Biz. If you found this interesting, we'd love a review, of course. Then if you've got any questions or feedback for me, you can certainly leave them on my website at katherinemaley.com or you can DM me at Instagram at MBA. Thanks so much, and we'll talk again soon. The fastest way to success is to model other successful surgeons who have what you want, but you can only see their results, not the path they took to get there. So you continue to jump from one thing to another, hoping to find something that will work for you too. But it rarely does. So try this shortcut instead. It's guaranteed to move you forward. I compiled my intellectual property to grow cosmetic revenues, everything I've gleaned over the years into one playbook of the most successful practices and what they do to win. Go to CosmeticPracticeVault.com and let's grow your cosmetic revenues.